Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending May 30th. I was going to talk about it this week, but I'm going to wait till next week and gather some more material because I think this is a cool subject. It's about the new Harley-Davidson Electric Motorcycle Project Live Wire, so I will put that off till next week, and I will probably use about half the show to cover that because it's a pretty interesting topic. But first off, let me give you this one from 1954 Shadow, blasting off today a satellite that sails on sunbeams. Actually, it lifted off on Wednesday. That was the Atlas V booster carrying the top secret, the so supposedly secret that everybody in the world knows about, and I've talked about several times, the X-37B, the uh, looks like a miniature version of the, the space shuttle. They're going to have some pretty cool tests on this one, too. They're going to... Um, mount a hull thruster propulsion system. Um, it's one of those ones that uses small amounts of noble gas and shoots it out and uh, doesn't produce a huge amount of power, but it just continually produces thrust, so it's able to uh, get craft up to speed and get them to travel um, some distances that you wouldn't be able to with conventional uh, liquid field rocket motors and things like that, so it's going to test out that on the project, but the most um, interesting thing here is the little CubeSat program. I've talked about that before where uh, people, even individuals, universities, and uh, in this case a crowdfund project can put together these little cube satellites to do different tests of things. And this CubeSat they're putting up there is a crowd crowdfunded source project and it, it's going to test light sails. This uh, particular mission that it's going, uh, that it's up on already is just going to test the deploying of the light sail. So basically they just want to see that everything operates correctly, that it's uh, ejected from the craft. Uh, there's some real thin wires that it burns through and then it releases some springs and then everything eventually leads to deploying of a satellite uh, of, of, set of the uh, reflective uh, sail. And so they're just trying to get that to work. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of it here. A timer tr starts the process of burning through super thin wires that release four spring hinge solar panels from the satellite's side. This exposes the compartments where the solar sail material is stashed. Um, M Enterprise Corporation and one of the leading engineers um, talks about this. Then a drive motor kicks into gear and the four booms unfold. At the end of each one of these booms is a clasp that hooks onto a triangle shaped section of solar sail material. Fully deployed the sail will be eight meters from corner to corner as the sails deploy cameras will snap pictures every other second so this is just testing out to make sure everything will function and then in a later mission uh... let's see where does this say da, 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 da. let me scroll down here uh... the second mission started for next summer will deploy its sails further out and attempt to demonstrate propulsion and maneuverability i guess the russians and the japanese have actually deployed solar sails too but nobody's actually deployed them and also demonstrated propulsion from the sails so um, except for some software updates and the addition of a wheel that ground control will be able to spin to change the satellite's orientation to the sun change the spin of the wheel the craft goes either way through conservation of Momentum says Ridgemore because the sail is around the satellite's center of mass orienting at different angles can let the satellite move obliquely to the angle of the inbound photons. In other words, it'll trickle, it'll tack to charge, it's, it will tack to change its altitude. No, yeah, it will tack to change its altitude. So, yeah, that's what they're doing right now. Today is a, uh, this mission is a demonstration project. The next mission slated for next summer will be to actually demonstrate propulsion. And there's a picture of it. I'll put the picture up here of what it looks like, basically. And, uh, yeah, so maybe we'll actually get um, two different propulsion systems tested. Besides the fact that because it's the uh, X-37 project, there's probably some other stuff going on they haven't bothered to tell us about. Like maybe they're servicing some spy satellites. Uh, uh, maybe there's another spy satellite in there besides who knows what else. But... Um, they are revealing quite a bit to us. That's kind of nice that we get to at least know some of what's going on with it. And next up, this is from Motherboard, the inflatable plane that would float like a leaf through Venus's atmosphere. Venus is our nearest neighbor, and all those surfaces in an unimaginable hellscape. As a matter of fact, yeah, unimaginable. You can, uh, on the surface of Venus, you can melt lead just because of the temperatures that it is. 50 kilometers up, the weather is downright pleasant, even if the air isn't very breathable. But before we ship off colonists to live on a cloud city, we need to learn a lot about the Venusian skies. So Northrop Grumman is actually proposing these inflatable type of craft to cruise the at upper atmosphere and uh, be able to get scientific data, <coughs> excuse me, scientific data and testing. So uh, 
they can project um, can actually um, see if it is something practical to be done. Mars is always the first in our minds when we think about space colonies, but in recent years, scientists, engineers, and futurists have been revisiting the age-old idea of living on Venus. Um, all I would ask before they bring any kind of people to do anything like this, I mean, it's fine when it's just robot craft, but before any people get involved, I would want a few safety mechanisms built in, too, because you don't want your craft starting to sink down towards the uh, fiery hell of uh, Venus's surface. Um, in many ways, an inflatable recon vehicle is the natural technological precursor to the establishment of a floating base in Venusian skies, and it's called VAMP is the name of it, a lightweight vehicle with a 55-meter wingspan designed to be inflated and deployed on orbit would cruise through the layer of atmosphere 52 to 68 kilometers above the surface, gathering scientific data for up to a year, while solar-powered propellers would remove the craft. VAMP would expend little efforts to stay afloat buoyed like a leaf in the wind. And the VAMP stands for Venus Atmospheric Maneuverability Platform. Um, still in the proposal stages. It's not something they're definitely going to do. There's been proposals before about doing this, too. I've seen some about uh, floating different balloons or blimps or anything like this. Um, this is a powered craft, so um, it's possible, but who knows yet. It depends on what NASA's budget's like and, uh, you know, who's going to sponsor it and who's going to go for it. This next one's from The Independent. Self-parking Volvo plows into journalists after owner neglects to pay for extra feature that stops cars crashing into people. This just totally blew me away because with the history of Volvo and safety and reliability in vehicles and stuff like that, um, having that be an extra feature to where your self-driving or self-parking car does not crash into people and having that be an extra cost item, I, it just, I don't know, kind of blows me away. Um, first part of it here, a video showing a car attempting to park but actually plowing into journalists might have resulted from the Volvo's owner not paying an extra fee to have the car avoid pedestrians. I, I would not even think of designing, I mean, with liability, with insurance costs, stuff like that. Imagine trying to go before a, um, an insurance company and tell them how great and safe your car is, but say, well, um, if the owner doesn't actually buy this extra feature, though, it does tend to run over people. Uh, I don't think I'd want to touch that as an insurance company for anything. I think any time you design a car that can move in any way at any speed without hands-on and somebody, a human being, controlling it, it better have pedestrian detection and it better have it working really good and tested to be, you know, extremely, extremely safe. So anyway, if you get a chance to check out that article, there is a, there's a video of the car actually. Somebody did videotape it. There's a car, a video of the car actually crashing into the journalist. So, uh... Not cool, Volvo. Not cool at all. I mean, you don't, you just you don't do you don't design things like that. It to me that's that's basic engineering and basic safety. And last up, this is from my friend Harley in Taiwan, Tamas. He actually started playing a game, and he told me, "Hey, Chuck, you might be interested in it. Check out this game I'm playing. It's called Kerbal Space Program, and he has I think four or five episodes up right now. I'll just give you the link to the very first episode, and then you can uh, decide to continue watching or not. But it's kind of like a Sims kind of game, but um, you actually start out with a basic spaceport and very little reputation and very little money to use, but you kind of by doing different missions you kind of work your way up and you get a better functioning spaceport and eventually go exploring and I guess um, land on other planets and conquer outer space uh, according to this is the uh, Kerbal website KerbalSpaceProgram.com Kerbal Space Program is a game where players create and manage their own space program build spacecraft fly them and try to help the Kerbals to fulfill their ultimate mission of conquering space so yeah kind of a little bit like a, a Sim City kind of program only you're just you know you're running one particular uh, portion of it. I, I have already seen the first three episodes that uh, uh, Tamas did put up, and they're very interesting. It's it's just hard enough and difficult enough to be interesting, but it's not so difficult that it's overwhelming. You don't need to have a college degree. If you're uh, somebody that's graduated high school or probably not even quite that, you can still have plenty of fun with the game. So um, it's simple enough to be fun, and uh, you just basically keep working your way up. You earn more points, you earn more science, you earn more technology. You just constantly build on what you've learned before. And uh, you make mistakes, and some of the mistakes are kind of funny, too, as you launch the craft. If you don't um, get everything set up right, um, something will go wrong, and then you'll have to figure out what went wrong and then correct it. But uh, nothing to me is really overwhelming. And just like uh, Tamas, a lot of other people have put up videos, too, giving you hints along the way. So if you get frustrated with the program, the nice thing about it is you can watch other people's videos about how they did it and uh, get a few hints that way. 
but uh, cost is forty dollars. I've noticed if you do look around from time to time, you can find special deals with ten dollars off and things like that. So you don't, you know, if you're uh, looking to save a little bit of money, maybe wait until they uh, put put something on sale, or actually just I I looked around for coupon codes and stuff like that, and I think I found one place that was running a, a special. But who knows by the time you see this or not? But just uh, like I said, Google is your friend, so. If you're kind of a cheapskate like me and you want to look around for a better price, um, use Google and search. But interesting, and uh, like I said, check out at least the first video and see if it's something you might enjoy. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.